can uh... go. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, our second uh, webinar. Uh, the title uh, is Unveiling Progress, Evolution and Trajectories of Mobispaces Use Cases in Urban and Maritime Innovations. Um, my name is Matteo Falsetta. I'm the project manager of the, the project, uh, Mobi Spaces. Um, and as you know, our goal is to uh, produce a um, data management platform that enables us to uh, go beyond the state of the art uh, of the technologies that uh, characterizes uh, both the urban and maritime um, domains. Um, so our focus is mobility. And um, the main goal of uh, uh, this webinar is to see what are the progress uh, that are uh, characterizing our project and our current path. Um, let me just uh, introduce you uh, what is going to be uh, the board and uh, the professionals that are going to be uh, bringing their experience so far. Um, and it is uh, my, my true pleasure uh, to introduce you to uh, Constantina Beretta, uh, who is uh, the director of research uh, labs in Kepler. Uh, we have uh, Ernel Dabi, a solution architect at Frequentis and Vessel Edge use case uh, leader. Uh, we have Lorenzo Mantero, uh, transportation engineer at AMT, and, I, and, and is leading the iRoute use case. Uh, Niels uh, Bo Nielsen uh, for the Danish Geodata Agency and CrowdSea Mapping Use Case Leadership. And uh, last but not least, definitely, uh, Martin Schreifogel, uh, Senior Project Manager at Bosch and is leading the SmartSense use cases. Uh, for those of you who uh, do not recall this, maybe, um, Constantina is leading the use case on the maritime domain together with uh, Owner Dabi and Nils Bonissen, where, where, whereas Lorenzo Mantero and Martin Schreivogel represent the urban domain in here. Let's talk about some rules of the game. Um, so the workshop is structured in two parts. Uh, in the first part, each use case will have the floor for seven minutes uh, to present their uh, results so far. And uh, in the second part, we will be having an open discussion uh, among the speakers. Um, so we will uh, we will talk about the meaningful aspects around the cutting edge technologies that we are dealing with. Uh, please uh, feel free to use the Q&A box. Uh, actually, you are uh, warmly welcome to, to do that. And uh, whatever is gonna be the question that, the, that we will not have the time to address, we will address it in the next newsletter. So you'll have the chance to keep it up and catch it up at any moment. Um, the webinar is being recorded for those of you who don't, do not know that. And both video and presentations will be available on our website, mobispaces.eu. So uh, I can't wait to start. Uh, thank you very much. I leave the floor to Constantina for uh, introducing our panel of speakers and please enjoy. Hello everyone, I'm Costandina Beretta and I will give you an overview of the marine traffic tracker use case, as well as the preliminary results that we have achieved so far in project. So uh, a brief introduction about the company. Uh, this uh, use case is led by Marine Traffic that is now part of Kepler. Uh, Marine Traffic is the world's leading platform for offering vessel tracking services and actionable maritime intelligence. Uh, so marinetraffic.com is an end-to-end -end service that tracks vessel positions based mainly on the automatic identification system. Currently, we have uh, the largest the terrestrial AIS network worldwide that is now uh, comprises of um, over 5,000 coastal AIS stations around the globe. Uh, so this is how we get our maritime data, our vessel tracking data that are complemented by third party sources. So we have partnered with uh, satellite AIS providers as well to complement our terrestrial uh, data. 
Uh, so this is a typical day at Marine Traffic. We get uh, over uh, 70 gigabytes of streams of AIS data that need to be processed every day for one uh, million users. So as I said before, we heavily rely on the automatic identification system. This is a collaborative self-reporting system that allows marine vessels to broadcast their information to nearby vessels and on-ground base stations. So this is basically a protocol based on VHF communication and initially it was developed in order to avoid collisions between vessels. However, now it uh, is a very valuable source of information for maritime situation awareness. However, this system has a drawbacks as uh, these drawbacks are inherent from the uh, collaborative nature of the system. So this is not mandatory for all vessels and some vessels may opt to switch off their AS transponder. Uh, so for example, we have the dark vessels, the vessels that cannot be tracked using KIS. So the objectives of, of this use case is first to develop a robust and accurate vessel tracker to resolve measurement to object association ambiguities especially in cluttered multi-object scenarios, and to develop techniques for multi-sensor, multi-object tracking in order to enrich information coming from different sources. So we combine the results at the regional level, providing macroanalytics on aggregated data from edge devices, reducing costly data transfer to centralized infrastructure. So the data that we get from AIS are basically messages that can either be dynamic messages or static messages. The dynamic messages contain information about the uh, navigation, the status of vessel, of vessels and characteristics of a voyage. For example, uh, position, speed over ground, course of a ground, uh, heading, navigation status, and so on. And the static messages uh, contain information that uh, refer to the uh, specific characteristics of its vessels, vessels such, such as the call sign, name, type, dimensions, and so on. So apart from AIS data, we want to get also RF data. So we have developed an edge device that is able to detect nearby radar transmissions in the X band and S band. And we correlate the detected incidents with AIS in real time in order to be able to reveal vessels, dark vessels in the area. To achieve this, uh, we heavily rely on edge computing. So we perform multi-sensor, multi-object data fusion on edge. So this is the overview of our architecture. So we have two experimental edge devices. Each device has a pair of AIS data receiver and radio frequency data receiver. So we get these two streams of data in real time. We pre-process them in situ. Uh, so in the uh, in the case of RF data, we have, for example, to uh, perform RSSI to distance like conversion. So we convert the signal strength uh, to distance and uh, we get the distance and the angle of the detected target and we perform uh, georeferencing. So we have georeference detected targets from radar signals. And this data gets fused with AIS data, which are also pre-processed in situ in real time on the edge device. And then we perform position to track association. We so we associate the positions that we have from RF data to the known tracks that we have from AIS data. And this is information that gets sent from the edge device to uh, a server uh, in the server. We perform track to track association. So uh, we are able to associate which sub tracks uh, belong to the same track. And then the result of all this operation is the global uh, tracks that then I uh, go to the mobile spaces data uh, space and then we perform semantic uh, enrichment and online aggregations before they get forwarded to our vision analytics component. Of what we have achieved so far in the project, we have the first version of the RF component of the MT Tracker implemented, the first version of in situ processing of AIS and RF data on edge completed. Uh, we have the edge devices deployed, and we are also um, working on the first version of 
Movie Spaces components that are incorporated into this workflow. Uh, the data cleaning component, the cross silo best and route forecasting uh, component, and the vision analytics component. So these are some results of um, part of the workflow that I showed earlier. We have uh, this is one of the places where we have the edge device uh, deployed. Uh, it is a terrace of a building uh, in Athens, and these are the results that we get both from uh, RF uh, signals and from AIS. Uh, so in this part of the project, the problem that we had was uh, the calibration. So uh, it is basically related to the phase that we have from the RF antenna. So we use this tool in order to uh, the nano DNA in order to improve the accuracy and remove noise. And in future work, we will uh, continue working on multi-sensor data fusion and uh, position to track association on edge and the integration of the aforementioned pro components from mobile spaces. And uh, we're moving from AIS frequencies to X-band and S-band. So that's all for me. Thank you very much, Constantina. Uh, you always you you were also very on time, <laughs> so uh, thank you for the clear presentation and to having illustrated your interesting approach to AS AS data. Um, please, owner, uh, proceed with uh, your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you. I'm sharing. I hope you will be able to see now. Uh, I will present the use case for uh, shortly vessel edge, but uh, open edge computing on board of moving vessels. I'm uh, presenting the project system. Uh, we are doing this project in collaboration with uh, AIT, specifically Anita. Uh, is our partner in this project. And on frequency side, Andreas Reisenbauer is the lead of the project. To give an overview of what Frequencies does, uh, that gives you about uh, what we are planning to do or what we are doing in the context of this project. Uh, Frequencies is a control room solution partner uh, for many government organizations and many other organizations work with in many domains from air traffic, public safety, public transportation, and many domains, specifically in maritime also. As you can see, uh, we are serving with the search and rescue, VTS, uh, vessel traffic services, coastal surveillance services. Uh, on the middle part of the uh, presentation, uh, you can see that maritime com communication is the important part, start with that. And for the safety, we are combining the safety, maritime safety information services and the sensors, DSC, Nautex, safety net. And on the right side, you can see that we are integrating main sensors, radar, AIS, CCTV, network sensors, and also uh, our matrix solution is very modular. We can easily integrate many other services like uh, recording, incident crisis management, best breed of other partners altogether. Uh, our strength is, that's exactly why we are here, what we are doing, transforming data into the information uh, and make it available for the operators to get the information where he needs for the particular task or situation. It is all on top of above uh, things. That's why we exist. And what they are seeing uh, as a maritime operator, they are seeing uh, our screen, ma matrix screen. As you can see, they can see the AAS tracks of the vessels. Uh, and this hexagonal represents the terrestrial AIS base station. Mm, you, as you can see, left bottom of the screen, there's an empty space, which they don't have the terrestrial AIS co coverage, but they can have satellite AIS coverage, which is very limited. Their 
position recording six to four hours and usually they are old it doesn't give uh, uh, proper information for the operator uh, our scenario is uh, when they are if they receive the SOS signal on this area they have nothing to uh, be aware of the situational awareness in the area. The only chance they can send a vessel to the area to see what is going on and their communication goes with the uh, normal communication, voice, voice communication. But in our use case, when we put the AAS devices on the far edge vessel, they can have the AAS and this information can be transferred to the uh, their center, maritime search and rescue centers, and the search and rescue commander can basically uh, be aware of the situation, manage the situation. In the cons context of vessel age project, uh, we would like to use uh, vessel AIS existing vessel AAS, and we would like to place a far-edge computing device on board of the vessel, and it will be transferred to their center, VTS or Marine Rescue Center, as a uh, near-edge server, and we process this information. We create the models, we share with the other spaces, like mobile spaces or other Coast Guard uh, organizations, search and rescue organizations. In the first step of the uh, project, we solved the architectural and uh, mapping of the solution. Mm, on the right side, you can see that uh, in detail what we would like to use, existing capacities. And on top of this, we make the design of their integrations between, interactions between them. We will receive AAS receiver information and raw AAS information data stream will be converted, decoded, and colonized AAS stream in the memory. And it will be a model will be created, will be exchanged, and tra trajectories will be compressed between each other. And when we receive on the near edge device, we will re recreate trajectories, recreate model, uh, reconstructed trajectories will be visualized for the, our operators and all the information will be enriched by the existing information for visualization. After that model can be also uh, shared with the other layers. And uh, as a secondary step of the project, we put the interaction with the other work packages uh, we will use other work packages, data colonizing work package, federated learning work packages, distributed uh, databases, uh, distributed sp uh, spatial temporal data and data management. And they will be repeated here. On the left side, you can see that uh, visual analytics and common UI and federated learning. Uh, for, during the project, we define the uh, interfaces between them. We try to use the existing uh, and standard interfaces. Most important one is the uh, our model interface, machine learning interface. Studies on this still going on. Anita, thanks to Anita, she's working on this. And detail comparison uh, algorithms uh, work is going on, development under going on. We will keep in this track. In the beginning of the project, what we have planned for the pro prototype is the, a, on the far edge vessel. Uh, we plan to have a use the existing AAS receiver, our edge device uh, is a Raspberry Pi or Intel NUC. Uh, and then we use the existing communications between the cent uh, far edge vessel and the near edge maritime control centers. We receive via that, and our servers container as a container host. They will receive, they will process the information, and model can be shared between other cloud spaces via internet, via wide area. 
uh, in the first phase of the... I'm sorry, apologies. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, but uh, um, for the benefit for also the, the, the other speaker to take the time, mm -hmm. ask you to... Uh, um, make the final conclusion if you if you have something to add or otherwise we can skip the, the last part of the presentation to the very okay. end of the... okay I'm just jumping we create the uh, lab environment we start to work with the other task packages and data after working with uh, other work, uh, work packages, we come together. And the next steps in the project, we would like to make the more optimization of the processes and the interfaces, experimentation with the other work packages is going on, uh, integration task will going on, and we will uh, try to catch the KPIs. That's all, thank you very much. Thank you, Una. Thank you very much also for presenting the, the approach you you have towards EDGE. Um, and Lorenzo, now the floor is yours. Hello, good morning, everybody. I hope you can see my screen and hear my voice. Hey, I'm Lorenzo Mantero, <clears throat> Technology Innovation Engineer at AMT Genova. That is the local public transport company in the city of Genova, Italy. Uh, we started this, uh, this project one year ago uh, with uh, the great ambition to have more information about uh, the renewal of our, of our fleet that is going on uh, from some years um, because we are trying to reach a full electric bus fleet in our local public transport in the city and the, in the metropolitan area of Genova. Uh, now we... We manage uh, 277 bus lines uh, with uh, together with <coughs> an underground uh, line, some lifts, uh, another uh, way of transport. Uh, but uh, Movi Spaces uh, focuses on uh, the electric buses that now are uh, 116. So as you can see through this slide, we go uh, directly to the point. Uh, our objectives that are uh, listed in the right part of the slide um, are focused uh, on this kind of, of these new kind of buses that we are uh, we are managing now uh, that have some problems and uh, peculiarities that uh, didn't have the old buses uh, mainly about uh, battery levels and battery consumption that is not so easy to manage as uh, diesel consumption. Um, so we, we, we would like to have uh, some predictions on battery level, both short time and long time, um, but also <clears throat> some predictions of uh, the main malfunctions that this kind of new buses uh, can have. And to do so, Mobispaces platform is already helping us um, thanks to um, the management, the good management of many data that AMT as local public transport company has, but not always we are uh, able to, we have the, the effort uh, available to manage them correctly and to use them uh, appropriately to, to have all the information that we need. So um, the data sets that are listed uh, in the left part of the slide are AVM da data um, that contain all the information about the service made by each of the 650 buses of AMT, so in this uh, project we will focus on the electric ones. Um, then we have GTFS and GTFS real-time data that allow us to have a real-time localization and then also tracking of each uh, bus of our fleet. And then we can combine this kind of data with the CAM bus data that contain all the information about the malfunctions that a bus can have during the day, but also the data about the battery level and battery consumption <clears throat> that are very useful in this kind of study. Uh, we, want, we also want to use some external data, especially weather, that can be correlated with the uh, battery consumption and also um, the gradient and uh, the altitude of some points of the street that can, um, I don't know if you know that Genova is a city built on the hills, so uh, this kind of uh, the gradient of the streets can very influence can really influence the um, 
the battery consumption. So it's a, it's a data set that we want to, to introduce to MobiSpaces platform to help us to build a better transportation service. Um, I will not explain because we don't have time the use case architecture, but it's only to show that um, many components of MobiSpaces uh, architecture will help us to, to reach our objectives. So we, AMT will, will share the, is sharing data sets with the uh, MobiSpaces platform. And uh, what we will obtain is, is very useful to, to manage our service. What are the progress uh, we have done during this year? First of all, uh, there has been uh, uh, a lot of work in uh, data set preparation. Uh, because as I was saying, AMT is a local public transport company, not very uh, aware of the data it has, uh, how to use them. So it's been uh, a good thing to start to prepare them, define them, divide them in order to, to make them usable to make the analysis. The second progress, uh, thanks to our technical partner that is uh, engineering, has been to start to um, analyze data, make some preliminary experiments and calculation, and start to build the first algorithms uh, um, based on mainly on AVM datasets. So trajectory data, uh, spatio-temporal data, um, and data regarding time between stops, uh, delays, so the first algorithms um, helped us to understand how to manage this kind of AVM data. And the first results that we had uh, also pushed us to, to choose uh, to start with a, with a real prototype, so not to go over the lab tests. Um, and for this, this first real prototype, we, we are focusing now in these days on uh, 30 of the electric buses that we every day run in the streets of Genova, that are these uh, shown in the picture, these 12 meter electric buses that run on three different lines uh, of the city of Genova, um, that are also peculiar for their uh, altitude, as I, altitude path as uh, shown in this picture. Um, because as I was saying, uh, in Genova, this problem of gradient is very, is very important, so we want to, to study it well. Um, with this prototype, we want to go on. So we started with the analysis of AVM data, the first algorithms uh, uh, contain AVM data, but we'd like now in these weeks to add slowly all the other uh, data sets that can combine with AVM data to have important information important information about the, mm, the battery level and the behavior of batteries. Uh, so canvas data, service planning data that are GTFS and GTFS real time, and external data. Through this, we will uh, have, thanks to MobiSpaces, a long-term battery analysis um, to reach predictions on battery autonomy and a full optimization of uh, our e-bus schedules. That it's a, it's a very important result and an output that we hope to, to describe to you in the next webinar or uh, at the next opportunity. So uh, thank you for your attention and to MobiSpaces for the occasion that we have to, to join it. Thank you, Lorenzo, for your very clear and smooth presentation. And it's also, uh, I think it's, it's very nice to see that there is an actual uh, you know, and living prototype already going on. So uh, thank you. Um, I leave the floor to Niels. All right. And I will see if I can share my screen. So can you see this? Um, yes. Now, yeah, from the, the cover. Yes, and it looks good. Yeah. Yes. OK, so my name is Nils von Nielsen. I uh, work at the Danish New Data Agency, and my job is to slay sea monsters. So let me explain. Uh, back in the day, uh, people or the cartographers would draw little sea monsters on all the charts 
especially to designate areas that were dangerous or where they didn't know what was going on. And surely uh, there would be no reason to employ such a person today, right? A person to slay sea monsters. But uh, if we look at the Danish step model, this is, uh, this is the best data we have combined in a, in a model. It's more than a thousand data sets. It represents all the data that we collected the last 25 years, uh, 150 years, sorry. And um, you see there's a lot of yellow and that means interpolated. And the model looks like this. And you can see in the inner territories, we have a lot of uh, good data. And then you notice in the North Sea that there are all these little dimples. Now all these little dimples, if we look closer at that, that's where the interpolation dragon, as I like to call it, lives. So there's lots of unknowns still. Um, and despite the fact that we're adding about five to 10 terabytes of data, each year, just for the territory of, of, uh, of Denmark, uh, it will still take more than 100 years before we have an adequate coverage. And for Greenland, this is, uh, this is even more so. Uh, we expect it will take uh, roughly 500 years. And this is due to the fact that Green large, uh, Greenland is super large. Uh, it is about 40% of the uh, combined EU coastline. Uh, if you were to, to say in terms of size, or about um, four times the coastline, the coastline of Denmark. So Denmark actually has one of the most populated uh, or uh, shipping routes in the world. So it's highly trafficked. And you can see this on the AIS tracks. Um, so this is, a, is, this is a heat map. There are lots of vessels here. And all of these vessels all have echo sounders and, of course, a, a global positioning system. And that means they actually have all the equipment needed to help map the ocean floor, except, well, it's not really being recorded at this time. So we thought to ourselves, what if we could record echo sounder data and we could evaluate it using edge computing and maybe some kind of AI technology? Um, and even if we could translate, uh, transmit that via 4G um, or satellite. So the last year, we, um, we tested some hardware. This is the box. It, the, it's basically an interface between the ship network. And it's the Raspberry Pi doing all the computations. And this box uh, can also be configured to communicate via uh, satellite. So we did a small test this year uh, just to see if we could get it to work on a ship. Every ship is a little bit different. So every canvas network, it, it's very similar to that, but it's also a little different on each ship. But we are able to read data uh, of the ship network, both uh, depth and also, um, and also the position. And we're also able to transmit that via 4G internet. We have not tried uh, satellite yet, but um, I don't know if that will happen, but hopefully. Um, so now we come to the, the last point, uh, and, and that is that we um, need to train some kind of federated learning um, AI model um, to evaluate all the data that's coming in from, uh, from the network of the ship. So all the data we're recording, there is probably a lot more data than we're able to transmit. And if we're considering the price of transmitting this data via satellite, then it, it will be very, very expensive. So we would like to maybe save some of the data for a later transmission and maybe have the model select what is uh, most appropriate to send. And also if, they, if, if it finds something that's very, very dangerous or something that's unknown, well, then we might want to have that transmitted faster. In order to train a federated learning model, uh, you need lots and lots of training data. And since we don't really have any CSV data collected, we had to get a little creative. And that's what we did here. So we have taken the AIS tracks data that you saw in the intro. We're taking the Danish depth model. Now that's a 50 meter model. Again, the, the total combined data set of all of Denmark. And combining the tracks, and, and gives us a position. And the DDM gives us a depth. 
And then we add a little noise just to spice things up. Now that not, that's not the only thing we're doing. We're also adding a little error to the data. And there's about a one in 200 chance of running into an error. And uh, depending on what error you run into, it also gives us a sort of a, a pattern of what is the probability that this error will continue. So the first of them we have is the rock, which obviously connected to the bottom. Then we have uh, fish. This is sort of a scatter pattern above the seafloor. And then we have the glitch. Glitch means that uh, either the navigation or depth or something goes to a zero value or very, very deep. It's an error in instrumentation. And then of course we have the bubbles. This is kind of a special thing. See, if there is bubbles near an echo sounder, uh, the values go all awry. So it will report, it will reflect off the surface of the water inside the bubble instead of the, the, uh, the actual bottom. And this gives a, a, a value of about three meters or so. So it's quite easy to see. And let's look at, uh, at the test data. So this is, uh, this is a plot. This is how, what it will look like. And you remember the colors that I showed you before as well. So bubbles are blue, glitch is red, uh, rock is gray. And, and again, this, uh, this illustrates the depth of the AIS tracks. And then you have the data points. So we have roughly 5,000 data points in each test data set. We can have many more. Um, but this is, this is recorded from the AIS messages in the combined. So the task that AIT will have going forward, and we're working very close to them, is to create a, a very good model, a federated learning model that will be able to distinguish uh, what is actual data and what is these errors and glitches. Now, these are uh, the most common ones that we uh, find in data. And uh, we can also, uh, going forward, adjust the model and make the test data harder. And um, so next year, we plan to have another C trial. The goal is to have the hardware up and running and running the federated or AI model uh, along with it so that we actually evaluate the data as, as it's coming in and uh, are able to trans uh, transmit only the most important data. And then when we're at port, we've got a good 4G connection, then we can send it all. At least that's our hope. And just to say, like our mission is the same as it's been since uh, since the very beginning of the Danish Hydrographic Office. It is to uh, to make accurate charts. And um, I included this little in, uh, illustration here uh, because I thought it was it was quite beautiful. Uh, people back in the day really took their time doing things right and. Um, we continue this tradition today. Um, and um, thank, yeah. thank you, thank you, Ines. Uh, thank That's you. Very, yeah, uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, for your presentation and to see that uh, traditions are brought up and uh, are coming along. Um, and let's see whether we will find some something unknown <laughs> that can be very interesting and fascinating. Um, so, Martin, I leave you the, the floor uh, to conclude the, the, the panel session. Mm -hmm. Okay, I hope you can see my screen and uh, thank, thanks for having me. Um, I'm uh, presenting uh, today the Bosch results, a part of the Bosch results. Usually, Gabriel Brown is the project manager um, in the Mobi Spaces project, but I will focus on one part of the contribution, which is the measurement boxes. Um, and this you can see here as a brief overview at least. Um, there's different contributions from Bosch. Let's start from the bottom. So we are doing traffic simulations or uh, especially simulations of the traffic-based emissions. So using uh, real-time traffic data, coming from counting stations, for example, um, and uh, uh, accelerations, we can simulate what will be the emissions from the traffic's exhausted exhaust, for example, and use this as an 
input for the air quality heat maps. So the general target is to get a map for the whole city area in Thessaloniki in this case, um, where you can see, okay, there's an emission and emission hotspot and so on and so forth. One additional very important data input is the air quality measurement devices or um, sensor nodes, which are used at uh, grid points, or you could call it like a calibration point of the heat map for the air quality. And this will be the focus of today's presentation. So this is what it looks like, or one of our device types looks like. Um, so uh, it's called emission measurement box. Um, and from the beginning of the development, or the, the core point of it is that it collects data for meteorological data, but also especially the different gases, NO2, ozone, um, carbon monoxide, and sulfur oxide, and also particles. So from the beginning of this development, we focused on the question, how can we make these data reliable and meaningful for simulations as we plan to do? And why is this such an, such an issue? Yeah, you could think, what's the problem? You can just buy several sensors, put them in such a box, and um, send the data to whatever cloud or so. Um, but to introduce you to the difficulties of such measurements, I have some example here where you can see the sensor data in red. If you take the raw signal of the sensor, in this case, it's from the company AlphaSense. This is what many competitors also use in similar devices. And then this is compared with the blue line, um, which is a reference station of an environmental agency. So what you can see is, uh, and in black, there's an additional information. This is the relative humidity throughout a few days. So you can see these typical day-night cycles. Um, however, you can see that in some areas, this um, sensor signal almost does not correlate at all with the actual reference data or with the true value, let's say. And this is the point or the big, huge challenge of these low or medium cost measurement devices um, that you have to spend a lot of effort to correct the data and take into account all the influences from the, for example, weather conditions to create then in the end what you can see on the right side that we can achieve a really good correlation of the reference and um, the sensor boxes. And this is what it's all about with these boxes and why we have um, or why we take very special measures to achieve the target accuracy. So just to give you some examples, there is um, very controlled airflow in case of the particles, heated airflow. Um, we have a double walled housing to shield the sensors from the temperature influences or direct sun radiation. And especially for the gas sensors, there is a very sophisticated um, correction algorithm and also correction hardware ongoing to keep these sensors in a certain equilibrium with the temperature and humidity to reduce these um, drifting or false signal effects I was explaining. Um, yeah, this is the core, let's say, know how um, of my team in this case. Now what we have additionally, or what we try to introduce, is a new version of this, which is much smaller and lighter. So the cost of all these measures is that the device here weighs about 20 kilograms and also consumes a few hundred watts of electricity, electrical power. And this is an issue for the installation or the choice of the installation poles. So now we have a new generation that is much smaller, only a few kilograms, and also um, has a significantly reduced power consumption, which enables also a solar-driven um, uh, operation. So both of these devices have been installed in Thessaloniki, which is also part of or always um, a certain effort to align with the city authorities and uh, service technicians to install. But all the devices are um, measuring right now 
installed in different locations of the city, as you can see here in these green points, sometimes close to the street, sometimes rather in the background. And um, this is now what we are, what we get. So we are collecting the data. You can see for a few examples here, the NO2 values and the PM values. And this is, you can directly see what is will be the next steps, um, which is to evaluate these data and see, for example, if the difference of these two points here, or of these two locations, if this is the true effect, for example, due to different traffic situations, or this is still an artifact, which would be uh, to be corrected with a new set of calibration factors. And that's my presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. Um, it's it, it's also uh, nice to to get acquainted about the fact that there are some boxes around the cities that sometimes we we have under our noses and we we don't even know what they what they are about. And actually, um, I will I, I will start asking you a question. Um, so. Why is the uh, approximate cost uh, of each one of these uh, 100,000 uh, euros? Yeah, that's, not the so uh, that's, that's the point. So um, the cost of the reference stations, the environmental agencies are usually using. You can see this sometimes in the street, which is really a big container, a um, few cubic meters. Um, the cost of such stations is at the order of 100,000 euros, and they take a lot of effort, which is exactly due to these facts that I was explaining earlier, that there is an, um, that there is so many environmental influences to be corrected for. For example, they are running real air conditioning inside, and um, they have to do maintenance on a, at least a weekly basis, and so on and so forth. And now we are trying to replace these 100,000 uh, or more than 100,000 euro devices by these small boxes. And this is exactly one of the tasks and challenges for this project to um, fulfill the task with still acceptable and reliable accuracy at much lower cost. And that's the game, the, the target here. So these devices, if somebody is interested, these devices are strongly depends on the number and, and the boundary conditions, but they are rather at the order of 10,000 euros. So you can have 10 of these instead of only one data point from the reference devices. Oh, this is great. Whenever efficiency, at least from my perspective, whenever efficiency uh, finds new place, um, it, it's always positive, and it's great that a uh, European project can make uh, this impact. Um, now, uh, as you as you can see, um, I'm just uh, going with the flow, and I'm not referring to the the specific order of speakers. Um, I was wondering, Constantina, what is the most change game changing technology developed in mobile spaces, according to you, and how your use case is benefiting from it? Um. It's really hard to pick, uh, but uh, I would say that my favorite one is federated learning. Uh, I think that uh, this is a game-changing technology in general, uh, and especially with respect to uh, the application of AI in the industrial world. So uh, we have the known issues of pri pri proprietary data and, uh, and, and co concerns regarding privacy. So we don't always uh, are able to to share data with other companies or uh, with other devices due to these reasons. So uh, it's very it, it's very it, it's a very interesting idea to be able to develop local models and then use a unified model that makes use of the uh, whole amount of data without the need of transferring data between end devices. So in in our use case. Uh, our uh, our goal is to be able to develop models in each ed edge device uh, so that we don't need to transfer any data uh, from the edge device to a centralized server. So in the in the use case, uh, we are uh, collaborating with UPRC, uh, developing federated models for for vessel rules forecasting. Uh, so we are able to 
uh, when we have a dark vessel, let's say, or we have a vessel that stopped transmitting AIS messages, so we don't have its current location, we are able to forecast its, its route using machine learning. Um, and we are able to, to um, uh, fuse the forecast location with the targets that we have for off, uh, out of um, uh, radio frequency data, the rad radar uh, signal. So it, this makes uh, the fusion feasible uh, as uh, since we don't have the AS positions, we have the forecast location and that can be fused uh, with uh, radar frequency data. Thanks, Constantina. Uh, and talking about federated learning, um, this reminds me the use case for uh, Erner. So if, if we talk about federated learning and machine learning, um, what could be the impact of these two technologies on your use case? Actually, thank you to Constantina. She explained lots of it, uh, but we can ba uh, basically say, uh, said that uh, there's two. There are two aspects of this. First of all, uh, data tsunami is coming to us uh, from the all autonomous vessels to IoT devices. Just compressing this data is not enough. We should uh, model this and send send this to the other locations, other cloud places, just uh, by the model, rather than sending the full data set to there, and we can reconstruct in the location. Second aspect is uh, when, sorry, <coughs> a second, second uh, aspect is uh, when we are uh, sending the uh, machine learned data, all the data, uh, all, all machine learning needs a training. And with this model sharing, we don't need to train the models and again and again, this trained model can be used uh, in many places and it will contribute lots of federated learning to AI uh, processes. This two will be the main impact. Cool, cool, Anna. Um, so we talked about uh, machine learning, um, we talked about federated learning, and another um, very uh, key uh, technology is uh, AI. So, um, Niels, I was wondering, after uh, we have been seeing, you know, ChatGPT, BARD, and uh, um, many, many other re realities uh, arising uh, during the past year. So how, how does the, the models we are developing uh, differ? And is it, can we, can it still be called AI? Uh, yeah, that's, that's the, that's the question, right? Um, I would be very reluctant to use the term uh, AI in, at least in a, in a general sense. Um, I think the models we are developing uh, have more in common with machine learning. Uh, so they're probably closer to the, to the algorithms. And for us, at least, uh, I think it's very, very important that we don't have these complicated AI models that sort of are evolved from a neural network that's unexplainable. Uh, from our side of the table, even using a mathematical filter to, to filter uh, bathymetric data is uh, a huge no-go. We like manual cleaning. So for us to be able to employ some kind of AI technology, it needs to be the, the X variant. So the explainable AI variant, where you know exactly how it arrived to, to that data point or to that result. We need to, to know exactly. Um, because it's our heads on the block whenever we make a, a, a chart. Uh, it's 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 lives at stake. It's environmental disasters if an oil tanker uh, suddenly goes aground somewhere and leaks because our charts were inaccurate, and we can't have an AI, you know, doing that. So, so we we have a very cautious approach to this, and and I think it's it's uh, far from the wild west that we see um, uh, in in the U.S. at the moment. The the way that uh, ChatGPT and and uh, various others uh, are developing. 
Yeah. And and how does uh, privacy and data governance factors uh, fit? Yeah. In well. This I, yeah, and that's also the thing, right? Um, and and this is, I think, is also a very good uh, question for the for the rest of the panel to to jump in on. Um, but um, I think the European Union also has has a lot more focus on this in in general. Um, and um, and privacy is becoming a bigger thing. And we're also seeing this with the digital rights as well, where you have these AI models that uh, all of a sudden looks like they're stealing from other artists in, when creating stuff. And, um, and, and this is, this is a, a primary concern. So AI is a good thing. I think there's a bright future ahead of us, but we need to be able to control it. Thanks, Nils, for sharing this. And uh, since I've been asking questions to um, uh, most of the panelists, Lorenzo, now I have a question for you as well. Um, so do you think that the results of Mobis Places will affect, um, you know, also the, the strategy of your company uh, towards the electrification of the bus fleet? Oh, thank you, Matteo. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I think that uh, our objective uh, remains to and will remain uh, to be more green, greener, so to have uh, a full electric fleet in the next years and to move towards uh, every, everything that can make our public transport that is already green uh, because it's public transport, but greener and greener to, to help our city and our world. Um, but Mobi Spaces can can help us to make the right choices. I think that uh, all the technologies that we we've talked uh, until now, especially for us, is machine learning and artificial intelligence, can really do what we cannot do uh, without these technologies. So put together uh, all the data that we have and find for us the the solutions uh, that allow us to to build this green electric uh, fleet. Um, so for example, to understand uh, which bus uh, fits better for that line that has that characteristic or uh, uh, how long can a bus run uh, in that type of day, uh, maybe a rainy day, a cold day, and so on. So it can really have an impact on our everyday choices. Uh, results of mobile spaces can, can have this impact. Great, Lorenzo. That's what we wish, actually, <laughs> to have an impact on a on a daily basis. Um, we we have from the Q and A also a question from Carlos Sanchez. Uh, Hi, all. How do you plan to deploy software and update data or configurations in the devices at Edge, considering the scale at which Edge devices could be deployed? Uh, who is who wishes to reply to this? I'll take a stab at it. <laughs> uh, at, at the moment, we uh, we don't really have a plan. Um, we have two or three boxes, so this will be something that we will do manually. And keep in mind, we're developing a, a lab prototype. Obviously, this is something that uh, will have, for instance, say in 10 years, that there are thousands of vessels that have this software on board. Um, then it will something that will be pushed over four or five or 60, whatever is applicable uh, in the future. Um, but it's not something that we're thinking about at this moment. Okay. Uh, uh, well, uh, I don't know if there is some uh, quick uh, contribution because we are one minute to go. Uh, otherwise, we, we, we will, uh, we will uh, reply to this uh, on a dedicated part at a later, at a later stage. So, okay, um, then since there are no uh, further questions, I really like to thank you uh, all for participating and uh, for uh, getting interest into our project. Uh, we are always here for, uh, for questions and collaborations. So do not hesitate to uh, surf on our site. Uh, and um, and to get in contact with us. 
I want to really also thank our panelists to take the time to dedicate um, to dedicate it to the project and to share it and disseminate it. And I, I wish you all a great day and a good job. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Bye-bye.